So welcome everyone to the National VTS session 11. So as ever, we're gonna look at some things that are gonna help you for AKT and a clinical update. We're gonna look at some consultation skills, a sample case we'll look at today. And then the last part today will be a live Q&A. Anything you want to ask about GP training, I know there's a lot of doctors about to start training, so they might have a lot of questions, but also there's a lot of doctors about to finish training. So anything you want to ask about GP careers, okay? So welcome back to those of you that are coming back maybe for the second, third, fourth, or 11th time. Those that are coming for the first time, welcome. For those that haven't met me before, very brief introduction. So my, my name is Mohib Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP, which means I've got a range of different roles. So I'm a partner in my own practice. I'm the resident GP at a secure unit for women with significant mental health illness. Um, I have non-clinical roles. So um, I'm an examiner. Actually, uh, last week, the week before, I was examining OSCEs at Liverpool Medical School. I used to examine for the GMC for PLAB2. Um, my main role is medical director of Umedica. So I teach anywhere from people applying to get into foundation to people applying to get into specialty training, MRCGP, AKT, RCA, CSA, GP careers, and so on. Okay. So we we'll start with some AKT revision. I'm going to focus today on AF. Then we're going to look at an update to the RCA, some big changes happening, um, and just an update on what's happening in the next couple of years. Um, and then we're going to do a, a sample case. And as I said, the last section today is Q&A. So let's start with AKT. We're going to do three high yield questions. You get 57 seconds, then you'll see the poll. Okay, so what I'll do is let me just turn the chat off. Good. And I'll turn my screen off when the, screen, the question comes up. Here we go. Now, this is a multiple best answer, so make sure you pick two answers and you get them, you've them. got to get them both right to get one mark. If you get one right and one wrong, unfortunately, you don't get half a mark. You get no marks in the AKT. The two most popular answers are C and D, sawtooth pattern and multiple P wave morphology. These are the two really popular answers. OK, um, so the correct answers, sorry, C and D yeah, are, are the correct answers. So well done. Um, <clears throat> just to recap, one second, just go back here have a quick look at a couple of things to look at before you pick your answers. So one of them is, do you notice I've put in bold here, which two are not indicative? So this is what we call a negatively framed question. And so it's important to watch out for this. In recent years, they have made it a bit easier in that they tend to either bold or capitalize negative words like this. So which two of the following are not indicative? I, which are the two things that wouldn't make you think, okay, this is AF. Like we can all see that this is AF from this picture, okay? Most people that got it wrong, it's not a lack of knowledge. It might be that you just missed this one word, that it's not, we're looking for what isn't what we'd expect to see in AF. So it's important you're clear what the question, what is the examiner asking? So which two are not what we'd expect to see in AF? C and D. So a sawtooth pattern is what we'd expect to see in H or flutter. And then remember that we don't see P waves in um, AF. So if you're seeing lots of P waves and the morphology is different in them, that's something that you might see in a multifocal atrial tachycardia, but you know there will be P waves there, all right? Whereas exactly what you'd expect to see in AF is what we're seeing in this graph. So there's no P waves, okay? You can see the QRSs are there. The QRSs are irregular, can you see? And they're irregularly irregular. That's one of the defining features of AF, isn't it? It's irregularly irregular pattern, okay? Um, the R to R interval as a result, so that's from here to here, can see is going to be um, varying from one wave to the next because it's a bit random, isn't it? And then the baseline is chaotic. It's all over the place, all right? Again, that's what we'd expect to see in AF. Whereas a sawtooth pattern, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute, you'd expect to see an atrial flutter. So AF is a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia. 
So usually they often have really quite fast heartbeats, um, very typical to be above 120, but sometimes it can be 160 to 180 or even faster, in which case it's quite dangerous. And it's typified by an irregular pattern, right? So it's disorganized electrical activity. You've got an irregular rhythm and it's irregularly irregular, okay? Because of that, you don't get proper contraction of the atria. And the things that we expect to see in the ECG are the things that we saw there, no P waves, Baseline's chaotic, an irregularly irregular QRS complex, so the R to R is not even, and um, you know exactly what we see here. Whereas in atrial flutter, this is the typical sawtooth pattern. Okay, so that's what you'd expect to see in atrial flutter. Right, let's move on to the second one. Here we go. Great, so most popular answer there was C, a 24 hour ambulatory ECG monitor. About 60% of you picked that. That was the most popular answer by huge margins. So, now, another little bit of technique. You can see as soon as you were to come onto this screen in the exam, it's a really long question. There's a lot of writing. There's like eight, nine lines nearly, okay? And so in AKT, you know, a lot of questions are three or four lines. You rarely get one that's only like one or two lines, but sometimes you get some really long ones like this, a whole paragraph of text. So something really useful when you've got a really long question, look at the very last part of the question and then glance at the answer options before going back to actually read the passage. So if you look at the very last sentence, which of the following tests would be most suitable to confirm the suspected diagnosis? And you can see the answer options are different tests. Now, when you go back and read, you're going to think, okay, are there certain things? First of all, what is a suspected diagnosis? I've got to find that out. They tell you that right at the beginning. Suspected to have paroxysmal AF. Then are there certain things in the history that are going to make certain tests more or less relevant? Okay, so you're going to pick up the fact that he gets it one to two times a week. And often there'll be several days between episodes where he feels fine. It only lasts a few minutes each time and they get better on their own. He's currently asymptomatic and his pulse is regular at the moment. Okay, you can see, so you picked up some of these things, but you know exactly what you're looking for. So now when you look at that, the correct answer is E, an event recorder ECG, all right? Now, only about a third of you got that right, all right? Um, it's a very hard question. So let's look at some of the others that are popular. The most popular answer was C, 24 hour ambulatory ECG monitor. The reason this isn't the most suitable, important to understand this keyword, what does most suitable mean? It doesn't mean what is generally the best or first line test for a condition? It means what's the most suitable for this patient in this scenario? So you've got a patient who sometimes goes several days between episodes and he feels fine. You see, if you do a 24 hour ECG monitor, because he has episodes which are often more than 24 hours um, apart, it's not going to help for this particular patient. Whereas if he had multiple episodes happening within the same day, then a 24 hour monitor would be ideal. But for this guy, it's not ideal because he has episodes more than 24 hours apart, okay? Similarly, at the moment, his pulse is regular and he's got no symptoms. Are we gonna find anything doing a general resting 12 lead ECG? Probably not. Whereas if he had symptoms at the time when we saw him in clinic, I came because he's got palpitations right now, then it's probably worth doing a 12 lead. You may well find something, okay? So that's why those two are out, okay? Um, Exercise tolerance test is not really relevant. It's not describing any chest pain, okay? And then an echo, there's nothing to su su uh, suggest that he's got heart failure or something like that. Sometimes, you know, someone with AF may also have heart failure and an echo might be useful later on to assess that 
kind of things, but it's not going to help us make a suspected diagnosis of paroxysmal AF, is it? Whereas what will help is an event recorder ECG. So what's the difference between that and a 24 hour? With this one, you just have it for 24 hours and it records continuously. But during that period, if they have no symptoms, you may not pick anything up. Whereas with an event recorder ECG, you keep it on and whenever you've got symptoms, you press a little button basically, and then it will record what happens during that period, okay? And so it's ideal for someone who gets symptoms once in a while and so as soon as you start feeling some symptoms, you press the button and it will record. There is another alternative. Maybe some patients, they picked up to have AF incidentally. You know, they're having a pre-op operation, for, for an operation, they're having a pre-op assessment or they're having a health check, okay? Um, and you just happen to pick up that they've got an irregular rhythm, all right? And they're not symptomatic. And you know, they tell you that they've not had symptoms at all and you wanna see, okay, you know, could there be something going on? You might do a seven day Holter monitor, okay? So, you know, same concept, 24 hour ambulatory ECG monitor, another name for this is a Holter monitor, but instead of 24 hours, you do it for seven days. So sometimes you'll use that if someone has more than 24 hours between episodes, but they're asymptomatic basically, okay? So for this patient, E is the best option. Okay, so let's look at the test that would help us to diagnose paroxysmal AF if we suspected it. So if they happen to be symptomatic when we see them in clinic, we could do a 12 lead. If, you know, they're not symptomatic or if they're symptomatic but you don't pick anything up at the ECG, just doing a 12 lead, then what you need to do is arrange ambulatory testing. So if they have episodes less than 24 hours apart, i.e. they have multiple episodes within one day, then you could do a 24 hour ambulatory ECG. That didn't apply for this patient. To have episodes more than 24 hours apart, then if they have symptoms when they have episodes, an event recorder ECG. And if they're asymptomatic, then a seven day Holter monitor would be ideal. Okay. Okay, last one from this set. Here we go. So we've got someone who's been diagnosed with AF and some patients can be managed in primary care. Okay, if they don't have any high risk factors and you know, we've got the diagnosis, we can manage them in primary care. So they're gonna be managed in primary care. So which of the following do NICE recommend as the most accurate tool to assess bleeding risk? So in someone with AF, what's the most accurate tool to assess bleeding risk? Okay, so two things that are important here. Um, one is, the word accurate. And then the second is that accurate at doing what? To assess bleeding risk. For example, a few of you picked Chaz Vask. Chaz Vask doesn't at all look up bleeding risk. What does it look at? Type into the chat. What is Chaz Vask the recommended tool for? So in a patient in this situation, you would, you would use Chaz Vask, but not to look at bleeding risk. You'd use Chaz Vask to look at stroke risk right? So stroke risk in someone with AF, that's what Chaz Vask is for. Do you see? So again, sometimes someone would look at, and it's an accurate tool for that, all right? So they might look at and jump to this and they miss that it's assessing bleeding risk. Do you see how it's not just knowledge, it's exam technique. Reading the question carefully is really, really important, right? Okay. Um, and then the most popular answer by a huge margin, 70% of you nearly picked has bled. The right answer though is C orbit. And this is a good example of where 
guidelines change all the time, right? And the exam will often test things that are changed. It's one of the reasons I wanted to cover this. So the NICE guideline was updated in 2021 in May, just last month for AF. And the most accurate tool now, based on the latest evidence, for assessing bleeding risk in patients with AF is the new ORBIT tool, okay? So let's go through what ORBIT is. So this is recommended the new guideline and one of the things that separates this to has bled, which is what we used to use before as the standard tool to assess a bleeding risk in someone who's going to be on anticoagulation, is that with this one, you need to do some blood tests. So you've got to get the hemoglobin and hematocrit. So if hemoglobin is less than 130 in men or 120 in women, or hematocrit is less than 40% in men or 36 in women, you get two points for that. If they've had a history of having a GI bleed or an intracranial bleed themselves, not family history, personal history, the patient, that's also too high risk. If they're over 74 years old, they get a point. If their EGFR is less than 60, so they've lost 40% of function, they get a point. And if they're on antiplatelets, they get a point. And essentially, zero, one, or two, low risk. Three, medium risk. Four plus is high risk on orbit. So orbit has been shown as being a lot more accurate than has bled. However, the guideline recognizes that has bled and is still currently in wide usage because a lot of the clinical systems that we have in GP, they haven't got orbit hasn't filtered through yet. Just like when QRISC3 came out, it took a while before it filtered into things like EMIS and System 1 and Vision. They were still using QRISC2 or, you know, when QRISC2 came out, QRISC1 was still there for a few years. Similarly, you still use, and has bled is still useful because orbit is specific to patients with AF. So if you have other patients who might be on anticoagulants for other reasons, not AF, and you wanted to look at their bleeding risk, how's blood still good for that? But orbit is specific to bleeding risk in patients with AF. Again, if we go back, got a patient with AF, and the question was asking about the most accurate tool, all right? Um, and so the latest evidence shows that orbit is much more accurate than has That's why it's the right answer. So again, important to, you know, keep up to date when things change, and also to read the question carefully again. So you'll see that in each of the three questions we've done, there was something in each one where even if you had the knowledge, if you misread the question because you were in a rush, you missed one or two keywords, you could miss something important and not get the answer right, okay? So I'm just gonna answer a couple of questions before we move on. A couple of people have asked, can we order an event recorder ECG in a GP practice? So it's something that can be done in the community. So in some cases, you might be able to order it directly. In a lot of cases, it's recognizing that if we felt that's what the patient needed, we need to refer them to cardiology for them to organize it. Okay. okay, so in terms of those of you that are maybe already preparing for AKT or thinking about starting for AKT, because a lot of you are ST2 going into ST3 um, and maybe already done it or about to do it in the next thing, a lot of you are ST1s about to go into ST2. So you're gonna be starting to think about it at some point in the next 12 months. We've got lots of free support for AKT. So if you're not already a member of the GP training support group, someone will post it uh, someone in the team will post it into the chat for you. Please join there. We regularly post revision posts, and then there's often free webinars that I run, and I will, uh, you know, post details of them there. Um, we also have an AKT study group uh, on, on Facebook that's specific to AKT. 30 days before every exam, I launch the 30-day challenge where there's a high-yield question and an explanation and a review of the guideline every day up until the exam, and then. Apart from today, you know, this is the 11th of these, but we also ran nine lockdown learning sessions in the first lockdown. All of that is available. It's like 25, 30 hours worth of free CPD on the eMedica YouTube channel. Again, someone will post that. If you're not already joined there, please do subscribe. Click the little bell icon so that, you know, when I post a new video, you'll automatically get it. Okay. Um, so there's lots of free resources. And then we, you know, offer lots of courses, webinars, resources, bundles for AKT from our AKT Pass Guarantee Program, which is our most comprehensive, 220 hours worth of learning, including an individual revision plan based on your weaknesses over either 150 days. So for the October, 150 day program started about a month ago or 90 days. So the 90 day program for October will start at the end of July. Um, our AKT Pass Plus bundle, which is 110 hours of learning. Our main AKT preparation course, which is seven hours, a full day covering, touching on all three domains, uh, with a full teaching mock afterwards, 200 questions. And we have three teaching mocks within it that are sort of mini mocks. Our masterclass webinars covering one domain each evening. So all of the key stats in three and a half hours, 
all the key admin topics in three and a half hours, all the key high yield clinical topics, i.e. clinical topics examiners highlighted as important or problem areas. They retest these a lot. Um, our AKT 200 question crammer course, so you do 50 question mini mock in exam conditions, sort of time to optimum pacing. Then I go through 50 answers, topic reviews and guidelines. Then you have a break. Then we'll do another 50. By the end of the day, we've done 200 questions. Then you get another 200 question mock afterwards. And then we have our AKT masterclass half day revision, which is like a for people maybe in just starting training and you're not going to think about the exam for a long time, but you want a good idea of how to approach the whole thing. That's a useful way to kickstart your revision. Okay, so we have all of these going. And actually, we're going to launch today our next AKT quiz challenge. So um, someone will post this again into the group. Uh, we're just launching this today. It will run until the end of July. Basically, it's 10 high yield questions. Have a go. Regardless of your score, if you want to enter the draw at the end, just put in your name and email. And at the end, anyone that has completed their details will go into a, a prize draw. We'll have a first prize, £300, for the first person drawn. We'll have a couple of people who get £100 off voucher towards any of the bundles, courses, webinars mentioned here. Um, and then there'll be some people who get a £50 voucher. So in total, there's £1,500 worth of prizes, okay? So someone will post a link, have a go. You can do it on your phone, you can do it on your laptop, and you, know, you might get a discount towards one of our things. Okay, so that's AKT. Right, let's make a start now on the next section, which is an RCA update, and then consultation skills, okay? So RCA update. The Royal Colleges have confirmed that the CSA will not be coming back, okay? In its old form, it just will not ever come back. But the current form, the RCA, the Recorded Consultation Assessment, will continue until at least 2022. And they've already had, for the last few months, a development underway, a new exam, uh, sort of you've got a task force, basically, a group have been allocated. What they're going to do is try to take the best elements of CSA, where you could have simulators, you could standardize certain high challenge cases, and the best part of the RCA, where it's real life consultation. So, you know, it's how people are actually consulting, but also things like that, the fact that a lot more consultations are happening on telephone or remotely. And so, you know, people could record those things more easily. So it's gonna take basically the best bits of CSA and the best bits of RCA and hopefully drop the worst bits of both. Now, there's no confirmation of when that starts because it depends how the piloting goes, how the development group finds it, the feedback from the first cohort that pilot it and so on. So the earliest that it's going to start is sort of this time next year, like for autumn, winter 2022 is the, the earliest, or it may be that it doesn't actually start till 2023. So you know, if you are in ST2 and going to ST3 in August, you are going to do the RCA. But if you're in ST1, you may well do the new exam. All right. And those of you just starting training, you're going to do the new exam. And then something else has changed is that for those of you sitting RCA, September or November are the last two sittings in 2021, or any of the 2022 sittings, breast lumps are no longer accepted under the mandatory criteria for maternal and reproductive. So here's a reminder of the mandatory cases. When you submit for RCA, one of your cases has got to be a child, 16 or under, one an el elderly patient, 65, more than 65, at least one where the main thing they've come for is a mental health issue, and then this was the one. Maternal and reproductive previously could include things like breast lumps. Breast lumps are specifically excluded now from this mandatory criteria. So someone that submitted that last year would have been fine. If you submit that next time, remember you, you submit something. Um, and as a result, if that was your only maternal reproductive, you then don't have one of the mandatory cases, you will lose. You get zero marks for that case, basically. Okay. And so, you know, you're going to lose 18 marks. That would have a significant impact for a lot of people. That could be the difference between passing and failing. OK. And then, you know, the others, you've got to have one that's a long term condition. So like a cancer, someone with a chronic illness, a disability, at least one that's an acute problem. So someone that needs either to be admitted or needs an urgent investigation two weeks or less. And then two or more cases that require a clinical examination. So these are the mandatory. So the key change within this one you cannot submit breast lumps in September onwards. In past exams, it was fine, okay? Right, so let's do a, a practice case together, all right, and get us thinking about some consultation skills through this case. So I'm gonna be the patient. So actually, I am a 43-year-old male. 
and this is a remote video consultation, so when we are doing this remotely, you're the doctor, all the triage note says is tiredness, all right? So imagine now uh, you've introduced yourselves, you've checked my name, age, date of birth, all of that's done. Just to save time, let's get into it from there. Just type into the chat some of the things that you think would be really important to ask me, but type it as you would ask it to the patient. So don't type some jargon or technical terms because then the patient wouldn't understand it. So, you know, what kinds of things would you like to ask me? I'm the patient. Ask it into the chat. Okay, so good first question. How long has this been going on? You know what, doctor? I've always been tired. I never remember a time when I haven't been tired. Someone said, define tiredness. Okay, that's a good question. But again, if you said it in that way to a patient, they might take offense at that. So again, think about how you might say that. You might say, well, you know, tiredness can mean different things to different people. When you say you just feel really tired, you know, what does it mean to you? Oh, doc, well, oh, look, as I said, I've always felt tired, but I'd say the last, I don't know, five, six months, it's just much worse. So what I mean by tired is like, when I'm not at work, I just have no energy to do anything with the kids, even just to go in the garden and play, or if they want to go to walk to the park, park's only 10 minutes from my house, no energy for it. All I want to do is just lie in bed. Is it particularly worse at any time of the day? Well, I, I feel tired all the time, but um, I'd say I feel it more when I get home from work because I wake up tired, but then I have to, you know, have to keep myself together. I take a few coffees and get through the day because I got to earn money to you know cover the cost of the household so after work i just i feel really drained so in the evening i think it's, it's the worst um someone's asked any sleep disturbance not really i mean i'm so tired actually I, I tend to go to bed early and try to sleep as much as i can but i still wake up i'm still tired someone's asked about any shortness of breath or racing of the heart no my heart feels normal my breathing's normal. Any stress in my life? Yeah, of course, it's all stress, Doc. Ever since this pandemic, isn't it? You know, like uh, I was on furlough for a while. Then things opened up a little bit. So, you know, I had to go back to work. Um, but I'm just, I'm worried because, you know, they've let a lot of people go. I'm worried that I could lose my job. I'm glad that I've got a job now. And it, you know, it keeps me going. But yeah, that's been stressful. Also, you know, the kids being home, like it never goes more than about a week or 10 days. Someone in their bubbles got exposed to COVID or something, and then they're home for a few days. So then trying to homeschool them, that's quite challenging, you know. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of stress going on. Mood problems. How's my mood been lately? Well, to be honest, I feel so tired that tiredness is getting me down a little bit. I do. I just feel drained. I've got no energy. So that that's making me feel a little bit like I feel like the kids are saying, can you come and play in the garden? Can we go to the park? And I know they're fed up because like they're schooling from home, you know, when, when, when they're been exposed or whatever, they're in isolation. I, they want to go, but I've got no energy for it. And my missus can't help because she's got the baby. So, you know, I understand it's difficult. Someone said any increased frequency in urine. That's a bit sudden, Doc. I thought we are talking about my tiredness here. What, 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 what are you asking me that for suddenly? Now, do you see... Just if I pause there, just, you know, to link in the skill of signposting. And you see, you understand and the other doctors understand why someone who's got tiredness for a long time, you want to know about increased, you know, urinary frequency because you're thinking about diabetes, right? But you see how to a patient, you're exploring, you know, what they mean by tiredness, what's going on, to suddenly ask a question like that, it's going to be a bit out of the blue. So this is where signposting. Now, it could be that, you know, um, your tiredness is partly because of the fact that you said that you're feeling down because of all the stress. But sometimes some medical problems can cause tiredness. So I want to rule some of those out. So have you noticed that you feel more thirsty? Are you peeing more? And you see, now the patient understands why you're asking that. So that's quite useful to do. OK, someone's asked last menstrual period. Now, here's a good example where if you ask me that, I'm going to say, doctor, I've never had a period. You see, whereas it's a very sensible question if the patient was female, but it's me and I'm male. So, but yeah, if it was a female patient, that's a really good question. Why? Because if they've had either heavier periods or having bleeds in between, 
Anemia would be a really common cause of tiredness, right? That's a really good thing to rule out, okay? Any muscle aches and pains? Actually, you know what? I do sometimes find that I sort of ache all over. My whole body sort of aches all over. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Well, what's made you ask that then, Doc? What's funny, though, is like I used to feel that way when I used to go to the gym, but I'm so tired I'm not going to the gym now. I just say at home, you know. Sometimes I work remotely. Sometimes I have to go in. But essentially, um, when I'm not at work, I just lie down and go to sleep. I'm not even going to the park with the kids. I'm not going to the gym. I've got no energy for it, no tired for it. Okay. Okay, great. So I'll stop you there and we'll have a look at some of the key things to ask. And you've got a lot of them. So, you know, how long have they had it now? This is where, again, a good historian will ask follow-up questions. I actually had a patient tell me this. I had a patient say, look, I just feel tired all the time. And so I asked, well, how long have you felt tired? And she said, since I was born. This was a lady in her 30s. <laughs> <laughs> what to do with that, right? It's difficult, right? So you clarify. Okay, so all right, some people will always, have you noticed that you felt more tired recently? Has it changed? And so like, you know, someone clarified and I said, been about six months. So a good question would be, did anything happen six months ago? Okay, that might have impacted or that might have changed. Okay, um, and so then you might have found out, oh, actually, um, I, I had COVID. Um, and then, you know, I felt rough. I was all right after about a week, 10 days, uh, but I've just felt tired ever since. And then the other thing is that, you know, we had a baby recently. So, you know, getting up, changing nappies, all of that, doing the bottle in the night, those things. So, you know, again, what could have triggered it this time? So clarifying, okay. Previous episodes, have they had other episodes where they felt this tired before, or, you know, tired than usual? How's it impacting? So again, mentioned about work, it'd be useful to find out a little bit more about what they do for work. Who's at home with them? Any other interests that they're maybe not doing now? Sleep issues, someone asked about us, that was good. Do they feel weak? Why might you wanna know about actually feeling weak? What could be going on if someone was feeling sort of like generally weak? Yeah, they could, they could have B12 deficiency. They could have a pernicious anemia, for example. Recent travel, it's possible. There were periods, remember, um, when there wasn't lockdown. Some people are still traveling to green areas you know, work related, be worth asking about that. Um, COVID status, yeah, you know, have they known to have had COVID in the past? If not, that might be something you want to, want to think about, okay? And then lifestyle issues, and sometimes, you know, that could be linked into the stress. You mentioned you've been a bit more stressed. You know, how have you been dealing with that stress? Sometimes people will smoke a bit more, or drink a bit more. Do they do exercise, things like that, okay? Um, and then if you think about the common medical causes, you can capture a lot of data if you ask very specific questions. So let's say you're trying to rule out, think about some of the common causes of tiredness, diabetes, anemia, thyroid, depression, okay? Then you could ask specific questions, okay? So for example, diabetes, you know, you already asked some of them, like, have you found that you're drinking more? Do you feel more thirsty? Are you peeing more? Do you get up in the night to pee? Have you noticed any weight loss? Anemia, so you could ask, you know, have you ever had a, something called anemia in the past? Someone that says they've always felt tired, maybe they've been tested and had anemia and it comes back, you know, they stop taking their eye and it comes back. Have you noticed any bleeding from the back passage? If it was a female patient, a bit more detail about periods would be very useful. Thyroid, so maybe asking the other way, have you put on weight? Do you find that you feel cold where no one else does in the room? Okay. Do you find that you're more constipated than usual? Depression. So again, a few people are asking about generally mood. A really good screen for low mood is PHQ2, which is a two first questions from PHQ9. So it's a two question screen really quick. In the last two weeks, have you found that you don't enjoy the things you normally enjoy? In the last two weeks, have you found that you feel down, depressed, helpless or hopeless? The answer yes to either one of those is worth doing a full depression screen. The answer no to both, they're not depressed. You could move on quickly. And then vitamin D deficiency. So, you know, Someone asked about aches and pains, um, you know, muscle aches and pains. You could ask about things like sun exposure. And again, sometimes, like, I volunteered a lot of this, that I just don't really go out. I'm in the house. I don't go to the garden. I don't go to the park. I'm not going out to the gym. I just lie down when I'm not working. Sometimes I'm working on the screen from home, you know, things like that. Okay. Um, also, you know, um, patients with darker skin, like myself, um, they're more prone to vitamin D deficiency. 
because even if you get out in the sun and we don't get much sun in the UK, do we? But even when you do go get out, you know, the way it's absorbed is different. Okay. All right. So now one of the key things that you want to do both when you're consulting in everyday life, but also especially if you're recording a case for your RCA or, you know, if you're doing the new exam or some of you are doing MRCGP International for your OSCE, is to show that you're safe by ruling out less common but serious things by asking about red flags. So what are the red flags that you want to specifically ask a patient like this who's given the history they've given so far so that, you know, it looks like there's a couple of things that it could be. There were some stress, there are some mood issues, they have got aches and pains, they're not getting out much. There's quite a few things there, but can you see, there's common things that it could be, but you also want to rule out rare but serious things. So what are some of the red flags you want to ask? Okay, so night sweats, weight loss, someone said, suicidal thoughts. Well, you'd only do that really if they screen positive for low mood. Otherwise, to suddenly ask that, probably not, not relevant. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. If they screen positive when you did your two-question screen, that would be sensible. Okay. Um, fever. Okay, bloating, someone said. Um, weight loss, a few people said. Blood in the stools. Um, bruising. Okay, great. So let's have a look. You've got a lot of them. So... Changes in appetite is a red flag. Okay, so are you someone that's lost their appetite? It's a general feature of malignancy, is anorexia. Okay, loss of appetite, uh, weight loss, uh, difficulty swallowing. Okay, night sweats, sort of you know severe pain or certain types of pain. So for example, um, you know certain types of pain, like if they get pain that they feel it deep in their bones and it wakes them up suddenly at night, that might make you think about bone pain, for example. Okay. Um, any new lumps or new existing lumps that are growing and changing, rashes or skin changes, rectal bleeding. These will all be important in the context of someone who's been tired for a long time. OK. OK, so now this is remote. So are there any relevant examinations? Are there any examinations that you could do remotely? Are there things that you could really only do if you brought them in? So you'd want to bring them in. OK, so what examinations would be relevant for this patient? Like there's not that much you could do remotely, is there? Some patients might um, have a blood pressure machine at home. I think especially over the pandemic, a lot more people have gone and bought one. Things like height and weight. Most patients know their height. Most people have scales. You could ask them to check their weight. Then you can get things like body mass index. If you had a previous recorded weight, you could see if there's been significant weight loss. Do you see that could be relevant? That could be helpful. Okay. Most of the other things you're going to need to bring them in for. Right. Okay. So what things? Okay. Great. So a lot of you have got the things that have been important. So, you know. Pulse, we need to do. Blood pressure, they might have a machine, they might be able to do it. You know, I'd want to check their sclera to see if they've got anemia. I'd want to actually feel for lymphadenopathy. And then other examinations would really be if you were thinking based on history about a possible serious cause, it would be based on that. So, you know, someone that mentioned that they had had actually um, noticed some blood some rectal bleeding, you know, you're probably going to want to do a digital rectal examination to see if they've got a craggy prostate or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, it would be very much specific, wouldn't it? But these things would be really important for someone with tiredness, just as a general check. So you're going to have to bring them in, aren't you? Okay, great. So we brought them in. We didn't find anything specific examining them. So what tests would you like to request? What things are, are going to help you work out what's going on in terms of what could be causing tiredness for this patient or, you know, just, just someone with a history of tiredness all the time, fatigue. Okay, so we've got FBC, TFT, vitamin D, PSA. You see, PSA in a 43-year-old wouldn't really be indicated unless, you know, well, in hardly any cases in a 43-year-old, you know, unless they had very specific features and you felt a craggy prostate. So, one of the things that's important in the exam, if you order tests that aren't relevant for that patient, you'll be marked down for that. There's a specific feedback statement. There are 24 feedback statements in the RCA, okay? They're all negatives. So that's one of the specific ones is uh, an inappropriate use of resources. Uh, someone that orders tests that aren't relevant for that patient. Um, and so that's something to think about, okay? Um, so someone said HbA1c, um, chest x-ray. So again, someone with tiredness, but no specific risk factors for, you know, not had hemoptysis, not um, had uh, a persistent cough, a chest x-ray would, wouldn't be a useful test and also would be an inappropriate exposure to radiation. So we've got to be careful about that. Okay. So think about, 
you know, tying it in with the history. So, you know, what test would be useful? Well, an FBC and an ESR, just to look for, you know, it's been a long time, several months. Um, so there's lots of inflammatory conditions that might show up, a raised ESR. FBC is useful to see if they've got anemia. Um, LFT, renal function, you know, chronic kidney disease can make you feel tired. Um, thyroid, that's part of a normal tiredness screen. Uh, either a random glucose or a HbA1c to rule out diabetes. You might do IgA tissue transglutaminase, okay? And then depending on the history, like this patient's history, aches and pains, um, doesn't go out much, I'd wanna do a vitamin D for this particular patient, okay? And then other tests only if you're suspecting, so for example, if they'd had a travel history to somewhere where there might be risk of TB, or if you were thinking about, you know, heavy smoker, hemoptysis, or just the fatigue in someone who um, is a smoker and maybe had also um, had some loss of appetite, or maybe they've had a persistent cough, then you know, there'd be a good reason to do a chest X-ray. Or younger patient maybe, and you're thinking about, um, you know, infectious mononucleosis, you might do one or spot test. Um, you know, patients with other specific things, things like making you think they're at risk of hepatitis, uh, you might do some of the serology to look for that. And then COVID antibodies, because, you know, if someone never had a test, because remember early on in the pandemic, a lot of people had symptoms and, you know, testing wasn't as easily accessible as it is now. And so, you know, it might be worth confirming if they've got antibodies and we confirm that they have had it and they've not had a vaccination, um, that you could be thinking about long COVID, right? Okay. So, and then if we look at the interpersonal aspects of a case like this, it's really important to acknowledge that if there's no clear cause from history, just acknowledging uncertainty, because sometimes saying to the patient, look, there's a few different things that can cause tiredness. There's no one specific thing that jumps out based on the things that you've described. We can test for, you know, some of the things that it could be. Be honest about that, okay? Being honest about the fact that, look, long COVID is a new thing and we really don't know that much about it. Lots of people will experience different symptoms. And so it could be long COVID because this patient had had COVID, they said about six months ago. I think one of the big things is that sometimes what the patient needs from us is just to show that we're listening, to show some empathy, you know, acknowledging, like, I can see this is really stressing you out. It's having a big impact on your life. It can't be easy, you know, having the kids keep coming home and then you're also feeling tired and you said that you're feeling guilty, you can't go and play with them. That must be difficult. You know, let's see some things that we could maybe do that might help you, you know, while we wait for the test results, that might help you feel a bit better. But even though you said you're too tired to go to the gym, you know, actually, research shows that doing a little bit of exercise, so even if you can go in the garden and, you know, run around with the kids, that actually that can actually help when someone's, um, you know, feeling a bit down and stressed out, and that might then lift your energy levels, okay? So things like that. And then really giving clear explanations of what the tests are looking for. You know, the things we're looking for are anemia, are, you know, low vitamin D levels, because that can fit in with the aches and pains. Because you mentioned that you've got this, this, and this, we're looking for this, you see? So it's clear to the patient, what what things you're looking for and what things are likely because otherwise they, again they might be really worried that you're thinking about a cancer or something like for this particular patient you know they're young they haven't got any red flags i wouldn't be thinking about cancer so it's important that they know that that you know we're not specifically testing for xyz cancer that's not what's going you know what i'm really thinking about for you is long COVID, vitamin D. They're probably the two most likely things from the things that you've described. However, as we're doing blood tests anyway, it's worth ruling out some of the other medical causes that can commonly cause someone to feel tired for a long time, like diabetes, like problems with thyroid. So your thyroid is a gland that sits in the neck and it pumps out chemicals that if it's low, it can make you feel tired. Okay, you know, if it is underactive, it can make you, feel... do you see? So that the patient understands what you're looking for, right? So that would be really, really important. So in terms of, um, those of you that are about to start GP training or about to go into your first GP rotation, and also those of you going into ST3 where you're going to be in GP the whole year and maybe preparing for RCA or preparing for CSA if you're outside of the UK doing MRCGP International, just want to tell you about our recently launched and updated GP 100 case crammer. So it's 100 GP cases, ideal for GP rotations or MRCGP exams. So it's eight and a half hours of videos. And alongside it, there's a 360 page PDF course booklet and they're arranged like this. So the case that we've just done is actually adapted from one of those cases, one of those hundred cases about tiredness. I've adapted it a little bit, okay? But it's one of the, it's like that where 
I basically discuss what are the key things to ask in the history? What are the things that you absolutely mustn't miss? What's the relevant examinations? What are the current guidelines for management? Okay, and they're up to date. There's uh, these, the new videos were just done this month. Okay, um, we updated, you know, things that have changed and, and uh, published the new videos. Um, and they're easy to access because they're in blocks of five. So for example, and you can see what they are. So, you know, like let's say you specifically wanted to cover sexual health. What if it's a safeguarding issue? You know, you can do, go, jump to that case, okay? So each one's five cases. There are four cases where, just like now, I talk about the things. The fifth case is always an interactive case. So there's a simulator, and you'll see it was filmed at the last time we ran it live. You'll see the audience is asking them questions, and I encourage you to think, what questions would I like to ask? Um, you know, and then you'll see the simulator answer them live, right? So there's 100 cases, including 20 with simulators, right? Those of you that are doing RCA specifically, we do have our RCA masterclass webinar, recently been updated again. So it's actually now four and a half hours worth of learning. Um, dedicated to past the RCA, includes how examiners mark, includes a lecture on the 24 new feedback statements. These are all negative things that you don't want. If you know what to avoid, it can help you get better recordings and get better consultations. Key techniques, you know, how to get really good recordings, um, how to select, because case selection makes a huge difference. You select the wrong cases, you might get penalized for low challenge, or you might lose marks entirely if you miss anything mandatory or breach any of the rules, okay? The differences between CSA and RCA, the common reasons people fail and how to avoid them. And then there's six interactive cases, two telephone, two video, two face-to-face. -face. This actually is, this four and a half hours is the pre-course learning for our main full day RCA preparation course. So what happens is people that book this one, they get access to this four and a half hours of video before the course, so that on the day of the course, we're going to cover this theory, they already know it, they know everything about the exam, and on the day it's just practice. So we only take nine registrars, and for that there's two trainers, so there'll be myself and another trainer, there'll be two simulators, so we've got a, a male simulator and a female simulator, and we'll do 25 role plays, and we learn through role play, there's detailed individual feedback. So you do four and a half hours before, the course itself lasts eight hours and a bit, and then after you get access to some cases to practice, and if you book as a bundle, and the bundle also includes a GP100 case crime at a discount, so over 20 hours post course. The next course is the 29th of July. There's only one space left. Eight have already booked. We've got one space left for the 29th of July. We've got one next week, but that was already full as well. Okay. So, last 10 15 minutes is for questions. Okay. So, um, anyone got any questions, feel free to ask. I'm just going to show you um, on our main website. If you go to the RCA section, this is the main RCA course, and there's a bundle which includes the main course, the pre-course, six months access to the GP100 case grammar, and two hours one-to-one -one coaching. That's our past plus, our most comprehensive bundle. Or you can just book the course on its own, okay? Or you can book the course and the GP100 case grammar. Any of these options, after the course, you do get 65 cases to practice, which are different to the GP100. They, they're sort of scripts for you to practice with a simulator or with a friend at home with mark schemes you know what would the examiner be looking for okay so any questions feel free to ask um that's the rest of this session what i'll do actually in case anyone hasn't got questions and wants to leave um please do join the gp training support facebook group if you haven't already subscribed to our youtube channel someone will post a link please do subscribe that way you'll get access to all the videos not just these ones i might post lots of videos onto youtube let me know what you think and what you'd like covered you know, in future issues of the National VTS. And if you haven't already joined the GP Training Support Facebook group, largest group um, on Facebook for GP training and GP careers, nearly 24,000 doctors in that group. Okay, so please do join. That's our YouTube channel. So you can see, for example, this video on the highest scorer in the AKT in his sitting, Dr. Raj Daliwal. Um, some AKT revision here, the past episodes of this national VTS, we're on 11 now, so 9, 10, 8, 7, uh, you know, various other things that we've covered, okay? Someone's asked, what's the most important thing you would advise for new starters to know? Right, if you are completely new to GP and about to start, the, the thing that you can do that's going to give you the most benefit is this, it's our GPST Plus Maximize Your GP Training course. We ran it live last weekend. It's a whole day dedicated to everything that you need to know about your three years of training. And it covers it, if you like, from beginning to end. It's everything you need that people don't tell you, all the things that cause people to have problems over the years and how to avoid them. So for example, the portfolio. 
that's going to be the heart of your training. You know, from the first year, you're going to have to start with MRCGP workplace based assessment. There's a lot of new assessments. We cover all the new ones and all of the existing ones. What are the checkpoints you need to meet at ST1 to pass your ARCP so you can go to ST2? You don't just progress after a year. If you don't meet the assessments, you might need to extend your training. OK, uh, we go through the e-portfolio in detail, the different types of uh, learning logs, how to use them efficiently, how to write a smart PDP for any rotation. We look at the other parts of this MRCGP, AKT, including some sample questions and why people fail, how to prepare, when to sit it. We look at the new exam, some sample case, uh, you know, why people fail, how to prepare. What other course and qualifications might it be worth doing while you're in training that will make you more competitive for jobs when you finish, more confident during your training and afterwards, but also maybe to help you start thinking about developing additional roles afterwards. Okay, so we cover these different course and qualifications. Important practical things that people don't tell you. You know, your contract, salary scales, pay protection, annual leave, working week, how to get exposure to things that aren't in your rotation. Why do people get complaints made against them? How can you reduce the risks of that? How to start developing a portfolio career or, you know, you develop a special interest afterwards if you want. But what things could you do in training that will help you afterwards? And then how to succeed in trading, how to make the most of each rotation. So basically, there's eight modules covering all of that, six and a half hours worth of videos. That probably the most beneficial thing you could do to just start training with a completely clear plan about an overview of the whole three years and beyond, but a really clear idea about the most important things for year one which are your e-portfolio and how to navigate that. Okay, hope that helps. Someone's asked, how long do I need to prepare for RCA? That's a great question. Everyone's different because remember RCA is your recording and submitting your real life consultations. So what's gonna be assessed in each case? Your data gathering. So your ability to take concise, focused, safe histories to examine your management and decision making. So can you work out what's going on, get the right diagnosis, manage it according to the current guidelines, and then your interpersonal and communication skills. So people have different levels of skills and knowledge already in those areas, right? So for some people, they might need six months. For some people, they might need three or four months. I'd say that's probably the minimum is like we say a good time if you want to come to the course to come to the course is three or four months before you plan to submit. Because after you've got feedback, look, these are the areas you could improve. It's not like, you know, if you've got a gap in knowledge, you could learn it in an evening. If there's certain skills that you need to work on, if you've been doing something for years and the way it comes across, it comes across a bit doctor centered, for example, even if someone shows you, look, this has come across doctor centered. This is how you could change it to make it more person centered, to make it seem natural to you. That's going to take some time and practice doing it in real life with patients. You can't change that overnight. It might take some weeks of practicing. So I'd say, you know, start at least three or four months before. A lot of people will spend six months. And it also six months is the time that you have to record. I, the oldest recording you can submit is six months from the date your results will come from your RCA sitting. So, but even before you start recording for the exam, it's useful to do some recordings just to get used to how you look on film and to use it as a way to develop your skills that you can watch them back and say, okay, I could do this better myself. Ask your trainer to watch them back and say, okay, they might give you feedback. Maybe you could change this. Okay. So I'd say six months is probably a good time for most people. Some will need a bit more, some will get away with a bit less. Okay. Someone said, is it GP100 more for RCA or AKT? So the GP100 is really for anyone doing GP rotations for real life consulting. It will help for RCA. You could also use it for AKT in that it's not got any AKT style questions, but of course, if you learn how to manage, if you learn what are the symptoms, what are the red flags, a lot of questions will feature that. But it's designed really to make you a better consultant and to give you the skills and knowledge to handle lots of different cases that you might see, because anything can come through the door. So it's 100 cases from across the curriculum, and that will help you for, you know, it, it, definitely some of them would help you for RCA. For those of you outside of the UK doing the OSCE part of the MRCGP International, it will help you for that. Um, and then even for AKT, the knowledge base will help you, but there aren't any questions in it because it's not specifically designed for that. Okay. Someone asked, what's the earliest time to begin looking into GP with special interest? You can't develop and become a GP with special interest until after you've qualified. But when you're in training, you could try to get exposure to some of those specialties using your self-directed learning time, using study leave, using some of your annual leave sometimes uh, to go on you know, certain courses or events. And 
you could even do certain diplomas or courses during training that when you finish your training, it's going to give you a head start. Okay. For example, I did the drug misuse certificate when I was a registrar. And currently, one of my roles is I work in a secure unit with, you know, women with significant mental health illness. Um, you know, some of them have had issues with drug misuse, but I also work in a community detox unit. Um, I offer medical cover there for patients who are detoxing from alcohol or heroin or cocaine. And having that drug misuse certificate is one of the things that helped me get that. I used to work as a prison GP in a secure unit in a prison. Again, having exposure to, because a lot of patients in prison have issues with drug misuse, that really helped to, to get that role. Okay, so you could start, and we look at how to do that in the GPSD plus course. But you could start, you can't become a GP with special interest until you've finished GP training. But you could start thinking about it during training, even in year one. That's a good time, actually, because you can't see AKT, you can't see RCA in year one, you can't do any of the MRCGP exams. That's often a good time to maybe go on some of these courses and get some exposure because year two and year three, you're busy with exams. Someone said, can they do their QIP at ST3? And no, you're supposed to do your QIP either in ST1 or ST2 in your GP rotation, okay? Not in ST3. You'll do a QIA and a leadership MSF and leadership activity in ST3. The only people that will do a QIP in ST3 are people that didn't do it in ST1 or ST2, you know, because last year during the pandemic, maybe they were rotated to hospital or, or something like that. But someone asked, any course available on home visits, consultations and management? So again, the GP100 covers all kinds of cases. So not just the different types of skills. And there's a list of the cases. But for example, there is an example of out of house cases. There is examples of telephone, home visits, of you know, sort of breaking bad news, of dealing with an embarrassed patient, dealing with guilt competence or the Fraser guidelines, safeguarding, uh, you know, menopause, skin cancers, peripheral arterial disease, a child, you know, uh, so there's a whole load. Also, things that often people find difficult, dealing with an angry patient, a demanding patient, where there's an inappropriate request. They want something that, you know, um, isn't necessary. Someone demanding antibiotics, someone asking for something that's not available, uh, you know, uh, within the NHS, for example, where we've got multiple problems, things like that. A, a lot of that's covered. Okay. Someone's asked if they couldn't do out of hours in ST2, do they need to compensate for it in ST3? So that depends on your deanery. So in a lot of areas now, it's competency based. And so, you know, you might take longer and need more time to get to the level of competence. In some areas, there's a minimum number of hours. So like 36 hours every six months that you're in GP, as well as meeting the competence. So you've got to both meet the minimum hours and show competence. Some people won't reach competence in those hours, so they'll need to do more uh, out of hours, okay? Someone said they're starting um, emergency department rotation. How can they make the most of that rotation? Well, a lot of things that you're gonna see in emergency department are actually GP problems that should have been dealt with in GP and they just turned up at A&E and they didn't go to their GP. So you'll see a lot of exposure to GP things anyway. But the other thing is for any job, any rotation, think about it from, the side of as a GP, what will help me and try to take those skills. So you know, start developing your consultation skills, developing, you know, being able to explain things, developing someone comes in and it could be a whole lot of things, right? Narrowing down your differentials and working it out what's going on, getting sharp at your examinations. OK, trying to do those things and link it back to what you will benefit from as a GP. OK, looks like I've done that one. OK, great. Well, huge thank you to the eMedica team, to um, Masuda, um, Anna, Tuba, Jabeda, Rabia, and everyone in the Medica team for all of your support and helping me. Thank you very much for everyone for giving up part of your evening. I hope you found it helpful. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great evening, and I will see you soon. Okay, thank you.